So about a year and a half ago now, I accepted a job that would take me to the other side of the world working as an English teacher in Japan. That said, COVID really started picking up around the time that I arrived, which made it for a pretty interesting year to be there to say the least. So I thought I might make a video about the time I moved to the other side of the world during a global pandemic. In August of 2019, I applied to work at the Japanese Eikaiwa, or English Conversation School, called NOVA. I believe I had a call back in September, I had my interview in October, and they basically said I could start as soon as December or January. So I wanted to stay with my family for the holidays and traveled out to Japan in January of 2020. Definitely a little bit more sudden than I was expecting, especially considering I hadn't even finished the English teaching course yet. But apparently with Nova that's not a huge deal because they focus on conversational English more so than things like grammar. While my time in the company had a lot of ups and downs, it was a really fun time and I'm super grateful for the opportunity to go out there. I wouldn't have been able to live in Japan without them sponsoring my visa, I wouldn't have had so many amazing interactions with great people, so I'm definitely happy that I went overall. I arrived in Tokyo on January 19th, 2020, and basically spent a week in Tokyo uh, doing some training for the company. That said, between the jet lag and the training, I wasn't exactly up to be looking around Tokyo too much, and I didn't really know that a global pandemic was coming, so I was more or less expecting that I'd be able to come back to Tokyo whenever I wanted. I never I wanted. I Nova's training in general was pretty eh. It was three days focusing on adult lessons and one day on children lessons. There's no real introduction to basic Japanese, which probably on me for not learning more before I headed out there, but it still might have been nice to have a quick hour or two class where I was like, this is how you order food, this is how you call a taxi, that sort of thing. But again, that's totally on me. Not a big deal. Overall though, the training did kind of feel a bit rushed. I wasn't very confident in being able to teach adults, and Kinder felt like a whole different thing. We watched a few videos, but they didn't seem genuine at all, so it was kind of difficult to understand how that would translate into a real class. It didn't translate into a real class, if you're wondering. The Nova method of teaching was more trial by fire. They more or less threw you into a class and said, good luck. Which, honestly, after about a week or two, wasn't a big issue at all. The classes were super simple, we followed a book, and we didn't have to make our own material. The book had about 50 classes that we could choose through for each of the five levels, and that would switch every three months. But again, the kids' classes, and especially the kinder classes, were a lot more ambiguous. They would give us a really short list of material, and then expect that to last for the whole 40-minute classes. And let me tell you, if you've ever tried to get control of a class full of kindergartners without speaking their language, not the easiest thing to do most times. Typically though, adult classes would have three to five people, or kids' classes would have five to eight people. And no matter what, we were told never to speak Japanese in those classes, so even if we had a little bit of knowledge to try and get the younger kids under control, there was nothing you could really do about it. That said, I spoke some Japanese when I needed to to try and make things a little bit easier, because it makes things easier for both the students and me, so why wouldn't I? While we're on the topic of my introduction with Nova, there was one thing that really bothered me, especially early on. During my interview, I had asked specifically if we would be reimbursed for our flight, and I was told, of course, you'll get half of it in your first paycheck and half of it in your last. However, that wasn't 100% accurate. When we had the training, they introduced us to two different contracts, the employee contract and the independent contract. Now, if you're an employee, they'll help with your taxes, they'll do a bunch of little things like that to make your day-to-day -day life a little bit easier. It's sort of, I guess, but they really play it up as that might be the better option. And then on the independent side, they basically said, we can't explain this, but you'll get your flight reimbursed, you'll have to do your own taxes, and... Things like that. If you take days off on the independent contract, you're expected to pay for them. That was interesting. But you could also do things like take vacations without needing approval, although you would have to let them know you were doing so ahead of time, and things like that. They also couldn't move you from place to place, which wasn't a huge issue for me most times, but I've seen people move for four months, five months at a time, and then be moved again immediately upon going back to their hometown, which doesn't exactly make for the most happy situation for anyone. Other than that, one thing that really bothered me about the jobs was the way that shifts were set up. Basically, each class was 40 minutes, and on an average day I'd have 8 to 9 classes. However, between each of those classes was a 10 minute period where we were supposed to talk with the students, plan the next lesson, and we'd have 4 minutes of that to do whatever we wanted. Which, in most cases, was planning the next class. Which, in most cases, ended up being planning the next class, or if you needed to go to the bathroom. However, you weren't paid for that period. 
And if it happened eight times a day, that's 80 minutes of your day, about an hour and a half, we'll say. And over the 250 shifts you work for the year, like that adds up for a lot of unpaid time that you're still technically working. Supplement this by the fact that you were paid basically by the amount of students in each class. And with COVID kicking in, we ended up having to cut most of our classes in half, which meant that our paychecks were lowered in general. Hey, editing Axel here, just something I wanted to add that I didn't really mention in this video. Something I really didn't like about Nova specifically during COVID is that they had this real fake sense of care towards the students and the teachers. So we would set up plastic face masks, we would set up shields between us and the students, but overall we were still in these tiny confined classes for seven or eight hours a day. And if a student or teacher failed a temperature check, the staff was instructed to just keep testing them until they passed. I've seen it happen a couple times and I really didn't like it. I had one day where a student mentioned they had just basically traveled all around Japan for the past week. And when I mentioned that to my manager and asked what we should do in that situation, he basically said, ah, eh, it'll be all right. And it was this fake sense of, we're gonna make sure everything's okay. That was kind of hiding the fact that they just didn't really care as long as they were making money. That really upset me. But yeah, back to the video. It meant that you were still able to keep things afloat. However, I was never really able to save up much money. However, I was never able to really save up much money while living there. So I was assigned to a town called Morioka in the Iwate prefecture. It's one of the bigger towns in the area, but it's still kind of in the middle of nowhere. It is surrounded by mountains. It is gorgeous. There's rivers running through it. There's historic parks, temples, shrines, really, Everything that you could want if you're going for Japanese history or to enjoy Japanese scenery. It is a beautiful place. And for me, I don't really like very exciting loud places, so it was pretty good for that too. I think the average population for the area was probably in their like late 50s which is fine. It felt like everything was very calm and relaxing all the time. I was originally expecting that my apartment would be very, very small, maybe the size of this room. And I had a friend who did have an apartment this size, although she was with a different company. However, my apartment was pretty damn big. And I think that's because I was in a smaller city, which allowed them to basically make my rent go a further distance. Now, while that was great, that also meant that it was more difficult to heat it. And in Japan, central heating and insulation aren't that big of things. So in the winter, it would be pretty common for me to wake up at negative two degrees in the house. Not a great time, if I'm being perfectly honest. Pipes would freeze, my shower might not work in the morning, depending on how things went because of the cold. But most of the year, if it wasn't in the dead of winter, it was pretty fine in my apartment. Something which was pretty annoying at my apartment, though, is I was right across the street from a fire department. It felt like every night they did tests for their sirens, or they went out on calls at two in the morning. And I don't know what was happening at two in the morning so regularly, but... It definitely kept you up most nights. But of course, I'm not exactly going to get upset with firefighters for doing firefighter things, so it's pretty forgivable and understandable, I think. What was less forgivable was my internet company. I had AU, I believe was the company. And I averaged at one megabyte up and one megabyte down, which is... Whew. I think growing up in the 90s, I might have had faster internet than I had in Japan. And it is not a great time, especially if you're trying to run a YouTube channel in the middle of this. I think a couple times of the year, I was able to watch things in 240p or higher. Oh, those were special days. Back to Morioka as a whole, though, there are a few places that definitely stand out as being very special to me. Takamatsu Pond was gorgeous, and Morioka Castle Park was also just really amazing, especially at Sakura time. They were beyond relaxing. I tried to go every other weekend, especially once I had my bike and it was more 40 minutes away, more manageable. And Sakura season really was something else in these places. They would be covered in Sakura trees. It was like an ocean of petals. It was gorgeous. Something I wasn't really expecting with Sakura season is how fast it was in my area, though. I always imagined it was like a spring-long thing, but because I was so far north, basically I woke up one day and pink was everywhere. All the trees had just become sakura blossoms. And then a week later, it was just gone, over. There was petals on the floor, but none in the trees, and it just felt like this moment that was there, it was amazing, and then vanished. So I can definitely understand why sakuras have this romantic feeling about them, and why everyone in Japan loves them so much. They're so special feeling because it's so fleeting. I can't really speak to southern Japan because they experienced that for a much longer time, but at least in my area. So now let's come to the big elephant in the room for this trip. Obviously it was 2020 and Corona was a big factor worldwide. However, in my area it wasn't too big of an issue. 
And I don't think Japan was hit too hard outside of more tourist or populated cities like Tokyo. I think in Morioka we only got cases like two or three months ago, so it wasn't too bad for me. But that said, there were things that were definitely affected in a minimal way. Most restaurants would close by about 10 p.m., and since I worked afternoons most days, and most restaurants didn't open until 10 or 11 in the morning, it meant that most times I wouldn't have the chance to really try most Japanese foods, which a little bit disappointing, but it is what it is. The school I was going to study Japanese at ended up closing pretty immediately, and wouldn't open for a big chunk of time, which meant I never really had classes to go to. I probably could have studied on my own, but I'm just not good at that sort of thing, so... It is what it is. And when they reopened, they had classes only in times where I was actually working already, so it just wasn't really going to happen. And traveling to other prefectures, while usually okay, was still typically a no-no. Most Japanese people still traveled all over and it was driving me crazy, but I myself tried to stay in Iwate as much as possible, which meant that I didn't really get to see much of Japan, unfortunately. I went to Aomori once to see a Showa Daibutsu statue, which was phenomenal. Basically, my friend dragged me out there and didn't really tell me what we were going to see, and I come up to this big clearing where there's this 70-foot-tall giant Buddha statue that I had no idea was there. It was a really cool moment. Other than that, I went to Tokyo one time for two days, I think, to get my tattoo. I went to Kyoto for two days, I saw Fushimi Inari, and that's basically it. And then I went back to Morioka and didn't really leave again until I had to leave Japan. So there's a lot of Japan that I didn't get to experience, unfortunately, but given the situation, it is what it is. And on top of COVID being an issue, there's also the issue of the weather in Japan, which... I was told Japanese weather wasn't great, but I was not prepared. Basically, when I get there, there is this mountain of snow, and, and it's just really difficult to go anywhere, especially by foot, so I didn't go out too much for the first two months. Plus, I was setting up my apartment, and... I didn't really have any money at that time, so the first few months were a bit of a write-off. After that, we have spring, which was gorgeous, but lasts, like a month and a half there. There's not really that much time to actually go out and do things before you're immediately met by things like typhoon season, a summer where you're in the high 30s for temperature and humidity can average at 98%. Didn't know it was possible. Not a pleasant time. Don't recommend it. There's the rainy season, and fall is pretty nice to be honest. There's a couple months there where you can go out and do stuff. And then winter comes back where you're bombarded by snow and cold. There's effectively a three to four month period where you can actually go out and really enjoy yourself. Other than that, you're mostly huddled inside in my area because you don't want to be affected by these downpours or this humidity. So it made it so I didn't want to go out too much, if I'm being honest. So a big part of that is definitely on me. Oh, and earthquakes, my dude. That was new for me. Kind of cool, to be honest, but not something I want to experience all that often. Definitely a big thing for my time in Japan was this isolation kind of thing. I had some friends from work, of course, and there was a lot of students I would talk to or whatever, even though the company wasn't big on that, but what are you going to do? But for the most part, the only people in my area that spoke English were my coworkers and students. It wasn't really very common for me to go anywhere and talk to anyone. And I wasn't able to learn Japanese very effectively or speak it at work to practice. So that kind of supplemented that problem a little bit. So essentially I went like six or seven months without really interacting with too many people. It was work and nothing most of the time. That said, it was great for me to just spend time and reflect on myself and grow as a person. And it gave me some time to restart my YouTube channel and really get things going again with no real responsibility to family or friends to just kind of focus on what I wanted to do and grow from there. And honestly, I'm really thankful for that. It was this amazing time where I could actually just be on my own and not have to worry about anything. I was 8,000 kilometers away. It's not like I could go visit them even if I wanted to. Basically, I was alone and free and for me, that's a good thing. So we're gonna finish this off a little bit more talking about Nova because that's what most of my experience in Japan was. We're gonna start with all the positive notes and then maybe move to my biggest issues later on. But for the most part, in terms of the job itself, I really liked it. The students were so cool and fun to talk to, ranging in age from three years old, I think is the youngest one I had, all the way up to I think the oldest being 93. So a 90 year gap is pretty intense. There were some students who were less than fun, but 99% of students were great. Like I loved going into work. I was always happy to be there and really excited to teach classes. The job didn't follow you home, which was nice because there's no grading, there's no planning lessons for the next day, there's nothing like that. So it's just following the book and then you're kind of free. That's definitely something nice and I don't think it's very common for teachers. So 
gonna take that as a plus. A lot of my coworkers were really cool. We had this super relaxed guy from California, this bright and bubbly British guy, two really excellent Australian guys. Uh, one of them, Nick, I have this really funny story with how I met him. Basically our Japanese staff member one day said that a guy from Sendai was in Hachinohe and he got stuck there and couldn't come back home. So I jokingly said, if he needs a place to stay, he can crash at my house, knowing he was like four hours away. Well, he ended up showing up, <laughs> and I guess the staff member didn't understand that it was a joke or sarcasm, and he was a really nice guy. We got along really well, so really happy he did. And finally, the last person I really got to work with was this Scottish guy who has a lot of personality. And while he didn't get along with everyone, he was always very positive and kind with me. So I can't really complain there. He was definitely one of the more entertaining parts of working in Japan. In terms of the Japanese staff, we had one girl named Misaki and one girl named Yuna, as well as someone named Yumi who I didn't talk to too much, but who was also very pleasant. And Misaki and Yuna were really my closest friends for the most part when I was in Japan. They were very, very friendly, very helpful, and just they really helped in making Japan feel like somewhere that I could live comfortably. There was something really relaxing about knowing that there were people in Japan who were able to speak English or communicate with me even a little bit, and I'm really appreciative of that. So if I was to thank anyone for my time in Japan, I would specifically thank those two. If you guys see this video, you're amazing. Thank you. On to the less positive things most of which comes from the company itself. The job was great, but the company, you know, had some issues. I think the first real problem I had in Japan was really on me though. We were told to come with about $1,500, and, and because of the time that I arrived, it made things a little bit difficult. But we were basically paid one month later for our work, and we would be paid for the whole month overall. So, that made things a little bit difficult when I started work on January 26th, worked until January 30th, and was paid for that period in February. I had four days of pay to last that month. I did have the $1,500 to sit back on, but I had to do things like travel to where I was living, get things like chairs and tables for the apartment so I could, you know, live in the apartment. Just little things like that that really added up, and it made it very tight for the first while in Japan. And it definitely evened out after the second or third month there, but you're not exactly experiencing much of Japan when you can't afford to do so. But again, that's on me, so it's whatever. What did supplement that a little bit, on top of all the issues I mentioned earlier as far as money, is that for the first six months that you work at Nova, you're on probation and you're getting a reduced rate of wage. Doesn't really make for the best situation. I think the first month that I had a full month's wage and had my rent taken out and all that, left me with about $1,100 for the month, which was manageable. Now, something that really upset me, though, was the way that Nova's contracts were written and the way that they focused specifically on making small loopholes that basically ensure that the company is always in the clear, even if they're kind of not working in the best ways possible. A big one for me is that you had a yearly target for classes to teach, basically assuming you worked five days a week, had full-time hours, classes filled each day, all that sort of thing. However, that becomes a little bit tricky when you have things like Obon, Golden Week, and New Year's time, where you have four or five weeks where you're not actually working, and the contract still allows that those days be counted. This essentially meant that if the company wanted to, I don't know, make you work six days a week or even seven days a week, they could do so without paying you overtime by saying, well, you're not at the required number of classes yet. Which... Not the best situation. At one point, I brought it up to my boss that, hey, I'm working an extra day, shouldn't that justify overtime? Especially if you look at the Japanese labor laws which say, if you do this, you should get overtime. And he basically said, look in your contract, there's no actual schedule for your shift, so working an extra day is not over your schedule, it should be included. A couple issues there. One, no. And two, literally on the first page of this contract, there's a schedule. So, I don't know what he meant there. But anytime I brought it up to him, he would just say, check your contract, check your contract. Which felt really dismissive, especially when that's potentially breaking the law. And specifically in the Japanese standard law, it says that the standard law overrides any kind of contract. Which meant that there should be nothing in this contract that allows for them to go around this loophole. But every time I brought it up, check your contract. That was a bit disappointing and frustrating, but it didn't happen all too often. The times that it did happen, and where I felt like I couldn't really refuse any of this, 
was when I finally asked for my own vacation period. Basically, you don't get any vacation for the first six months you work there while you're on probation. Totally understandable. But by the time we hit November, so my last two or three months in Japan, I was looking to have a vacation for my birthday to get the tattoo and go to Tokyo and Kyoto. But I was told that it probably wasn't possible to do that, so we had to limit the days that I was asking for, which is fine, I guess. I understand we're a bit low on staff. But he eventually said, you know, Oh, it would be so much easier to get your vacation booked if, I don't know, if we had someone who could help out on Hachinohe on your days off. Kind of implying that if I had not worked those days in Hachinohe, those extra days without overtime pay, that I wouldn't be getting my vacation, which I didn't like that too much. And the final thing that really rubbed me the wrong way with Nova was the period where I was moving away from them. So to start this, my final shift was supposed to be on January 20th, and I called my manager Jeff and said, Hey, when do I need to be out of my apartment? And he said, oh, when's your last day? The 20th. All right, well, you work that day, but can you get out of there that morning? Basically wanting me to move out of my house the same day that I was going in for my last shift. Which, like, is difficult to do in general, let alone if you're planning to move 8,000 kilometers away, right? So when I brought it up to him that that would be a bit difficult, he said, well, you could use your vacation day on the last day so you don't have to go in for work there, basically forcing me to use one of my vacation days so I wouldn't have a horrible time moving out of my house. Which, like, Something about that doesn't add up in my head, and it still doesn't. I don't like that that's how it happened. The moving out experience was made even worse when we come into the issue of my second last pay. It was my understanding, and the understanding of everyone that I talked to, that my last rent and my utilities would come out of my last pay, the one that I'm going to be getting this month while I live in Canada because of the way that the pays are delayed like that. However, my manager called me maybe three days before my paycheck went into my account and said, Adam, oh totally forgot to call you. We're going to have to take your next rent, this rent, and your utilities, as well as a cleaning fee, out of this paycheck. And I said, Jeff, can we not do that since I'm actively trying to leave the country right now and that would severely impact how much money I have? And he said, well, we're too late now, but uh, you still will get about $400. So for my last paycheck while I was in Japan, again, about five days before I was actually planning to move out of Japan for my flight, I had $400 to get through, and my COVID test ended up being $325. Put those together and you got about $75 to mess around with. Luckily, I did some streams to kind of raise a little bit of money, and there were so many phenomenal people who helped out. So you guys really helped with that situation. Thank you so much. And I definitely would have been in a much worse spot without you. So overall, I'm not a big fan of Nova as a company, but the day-to-day -day life of working there was not really terrible. These were very specific situations and not things I had to deal with every single day of my time there. And I really did enjoy the day-to-day -day life. Going into work was never difficult, was never unpleasant, and it was always something I was happy to do. I loved the job, and I would recommend that anyone go and do it. The company Nova is a different story, but... The job itself was phenomenal. If you were going to look for a job to do in Japan and wanted to do like a year for Nova, you're probably going to have a fine time, although I wouldn't really recommend you staying much longer than a year or two. All that said, they did give me this amazing opportunity to move to a country that I loved to meet hundreds of amazing students and a bunch of great people that I was able to become friends with. I grew a lot as a person, was able to put myself in a situation where YouTube can be a job for me, and gain some experiences and relationships that I'm going to have for the rest of my life. So a big thank you to Misaki, Yuna, Yumi, Anthony, Gareth, Ben, Nick, Steve. You guys are all phenomenal. I look forward to seeing you if I ever come back to Morioka, and I hope you enjoyed our time together as much as I did. But I think that's where we're gonna wrap things up for this video. Thank you guys so much for coming to check this one out, and until next time, remember to stay excellent.